and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much again for making the time uh, this afternoon to be with us. Okay, as we launch our Simbang Kalau Bimbang campaign. Okay, uh, whereby you know we want to uh, everyone to be able to express uh, what's concerning you and you know to sort of like you know uh, destigmatize. Uh, mental health uh, sort of a concern uh, so that you know we can talk about it freely openly and without uh, judgment in that sense all right to begin uh, i would like to invite che hidaya from hsse department uh, to sort of you know uh, give uh, a little bit of hse briefing and hse moment please welcome hi good afternoon everyone uh, okay, so before kita mulakan dengan program mental health talk kita hari ini, sedikit about emergency evacuation. Uh, so, kita sekarang berada di bilik serbaguna Ekwapura. Okay, uh, sekiranya ada uh, kedengaran penggera kecemasan, sila bergerak dengan tenang ke arah tangga kecemasan yang berdekatan dengan uh, sebelah lift. Okay, dan bergerak dengan tenang ke arah assembly point. Assembly point kita di luar berdekatan dengan... Uh, Menara TM, ada roundabout kecil Ah, ok, so kita boleh tengok kasi kita berada di sini, di Black Corpora And then you all can bergerak ke arah tepi situ Terus ke pintu kecemasan Dan pintu kecemasan, ada kat sini lah roundabout That is our assembly point Ok, uh, we're done with the safety briefing So sekarang sedikit on HSSE moment Ok, so bersesuaian dengan tajuk mental health talk today I want to share a little bit about Dopamine dressing. So, ada video. Can just play the short video. Take a gambar baju tu. Yes. Let's talk about dopamine dressing. According to behavioral psychologist and author of The Psychology of Fashion, Dr. Carolyn Meyer says that dopamine dressing refers to a person's motivation to dress in a way that will result in a positive outcome, like feeling more confident, confident, or happy. Whenever you have feelings of satisfaction, pleasure, or even motivation, you're releasing dopamine. And the same thing can be said about the way you dress. To understand dopamine dressing a little bit better, we have to know the science behind enclosed cognition. Enclosed cognition describes the effect that our clothes have on various psychological processes, such as emotions and self-evaluation. Understanding all of this, it's no surprise that when we wear clothes that we enjoy and that we love, not only do we look confident and look happy, we feel confident and happy on the inside. Okay, so today, dopamine dressing is all about, uh, you know, wearing bold patterns and bright colors to improve your mood and it's proven to even affect your health. Uh, mental health in a positive way. So the next time you're feeling a little blue, try something yellow instead. Okay, so I'd like to call in uh, Che Elina Basri, the Head of Corporate Communication, to deliver her welcoming remarks. Please welcome. Thank you, Dr. Hidayah. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Hi. 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 Hi.
for those in need through joy in every drop. That's why this year, in conjunction with World Mental Health Month, we are collaborating with several partners such as Malaysian Mental Health Association, Mental Illness Awareness and Support Association, Nyawa, Malaysia Medical Association Selangor, We Love You Box and Selangor Football Club. We're not just talking about providing safe spaces and support channels, we are also discussing the need for more resources and volunteers. It's a big task, but with your support, we're diving and making a difference together. So together, let's help to stimulate the change, break the stigma, and talk it out. Here's to a nation where mental health isn't a taboo, but a topic we embrace with open hearts and open minds. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank all our guests today for taking some time to be part of this initiative. Uh, Fananita, uh, Dr. Lilaini, Mr. David Mu, Brandon, Sharifa, and Samuel. Thank you. Everyone here will be the first to watch our exclusive Sembang Kalau Bimbang video featuring Slango's FC captain, Brandon Gunn. I encourage you to watch, get inspired, and most importantly, help us with spreading the awareness about mental health to all your friends and family. So let's watch it together. Hey bro, it's been a while. How have you been? Bro, you don't look so good. Are you okay? Actually, I... Aku... I'm not okay. Aku tak okay. Aku rasa hidup aku ni macam dah tak ada purpose. Aku tak tahu aku nak share dengan siapa. Ah, tapi aku tak tahulah kalau ada orang nak dengar. Oh, you never know until you try. You can tell me when you're ready.
day whenever I'm worried, Brendan Gunn never WhatsApp me, right? Of course, if Brendan Gunn WhatsApp me, I wouldn't be to bin bang to sing bang, right? Anywho, anywho. So uh, I just hope, like you know, everyone, uh, if you can uh, silence your phone, unless you're worried, Brendan Gunn message you and you miss it, uh, put it on vibration mode, okay? So <laughs> to continue uh, with our uh, next agenda. Uh, I would like to call upon Puan Anita Bubaka, the president and founder of Miasa, uh, to deliver her presentation and share with us the current state of mental health in Malaysia. To sort of like you know, then look into discussion of like you know the myth of mental health, uh, as well as the challenges you know uh, that the uh, the privilege uh, the B forty face uh, with mental health. So with that, please welcome. Thank you very much, Dad. Alright, Salam Alaikum, very good afternoon everyone. Thank you very much, Ais Langmo, uh, for bringing forth this very awesome campaign, Simbang, Simbang Kalau Bimbang, and also to We Love You Box, thank you so much. So I'll be discussing on a couple of things, very important obviously, um, when we talk about the issue of stigma. I was told that I can't move um, you know, very much because of the camera, so I am limited or restricted to this podium right here. Uh, so I apologize if I can't go to you. Uh, so I will be talking about um, the myths when we talk about mental health. So what is the stigma, negative perception when it comes to mental health, mental health issues, mental health conditions, uh, and also the challenges that are faced by the B40 community. Now before I begin, just a little bit about the perspective or approach that I will be coming from is from the voices of people with lived experience. So I'm a person with lived experience of a mental health condition, and the organization that I run, are uh, the majority of us are also people with lived experience, caregivers, and also mental health advocates, people that are passionate for the cause of mental health. So today my job is to amplify our voices and also to spur actions at all levels. So please give a big hand to Iris Langwa and We Love You Box. Thank you very much. So this is our big why, um, and I always begin with this because it's very important for all of us to understand how crucial the conversation of mental health, and if you have a little bit of time to advocate for this cause, right? If we look at data and statistics today, we're looking at the prevalence of, especially and specifically anxiety and depression has increased by 25%, guys. Uh, this is a data that was released last year you know, after the pandemic hit. So we're looking at a lot of people today struggling with a clinical diagnosis of anxiety and depression and really various mental health challenges. But specifically to the workplace context is anxiety and depression. And during the pandemic was more adjustment disorders, obviously, and also acute stress uh, disorder. So disability rights are human rights and people living with mental health condition, it's one category of um, a disability in Malaysia. And everyone has a right to mental health, like how we all have a right to physical health, and everyone deserves the chance to thrive. Now, when we are talking about people living with mental health condition within the context of Malaysia, not everyone's recovery journey is going to be successful, right? And that's the reality. And so that's why we're talking about the challenges of the B40 groups, and of course, the more marginalized and vulnerable communities. And we must enable you know, everyone's recovery in the community, and we must give everyone that opportunity to thrive. So at Miasa, this is our mission. Our mission is to help people, is to save lives and create hope amidst uncertainties. And now when we talk about saving lives, you know, there's a lot of, well, various conversations, right, uh, pertaining to mental health. It could be talking about suicide. It could be talking about social determinants of health and mental health. The conversation of mental health is very much linked to the conversation of suicide. It's because when you're struggling with a mental health condition and if you don't get that help, that treatment and support that you need and require, this is when suicidal thoughts and tendencies come in. You feel hopeless. You feel trapped within your struggles. And then the unimaginable act of suicide happens. And suicide, let me tell you guys, it's 100% preventable and I will, uh, I will share with you here shortly on how we can do that together. So we want to end stigma, discrimination and promote human rights in mental health care settings and of course outside. And in the work that we do, 
every single day we witness how our own peers, people, people who live with mental health conditions, how they face stigmatization, discrimination, injustices, and also human rights abuses and violations. So this is very much um, what we see in the work that we do. So it's really doing what is right, not what is easy. So we can all advocate more effectively by joining the community. And so one of the things that we do is, of course, volunteering work. So if you have a little bit of time, uh, you can also join us and our friends um, you know, on the ground doing this job. So it is a painful and humbling journey, but all in all a very meaningful and also very rewarding. So let me just share with you this video really quickly, um, and we'll open up um, for some discussion. Thank you. So let me just share with you, um, and as if we could tell what is wrong about a person for some what is right just on sight. So wrong was just a simple matter of right, right here or left. As if you could right. tell what is and wrong about a person, left to wander on your own. Right just it is on normal side. to feel left out and be on the wrong. That you have to deserve to be right, right in. So you keep everything in. Because if you are right, right, tell what is wrong about a person, you keep it better you need to get on sight. Because people only understand the different when it is an accent or a here. color or a sin. So even when your so body is breaking from within, you try to behave the same as everyone else. Right, just by feeling sight. that you're lying to your the wrong spirit seeping through stitches that graft by just on the side to your skin. The wrong relay like you saw. I turned out okay. Get over it. Get to keep on side. Don't mind the I just on the side don't deserve to you. Wonder what it would be like if they actually met you. It already felt like they did. Maybe that was why some of us tried giving up. Then it was already side. hard enough because it works a little differently for us than it does everyone Jabal. else. So we tried to find ways to set our minds to rest, only to discover that dying was harder. Our souls just wouldn't let go. I just find to tell why. You start wondering what is wrong with your Jabal. body. Sometimes it feels like the wrong body. But your heart is an old car doing 180 and every interaction is a traffic collision because every pulse is like an accident about to happen but never really does feeling like it already did wrong. until crashing is the only way of resting that you can think of. You wonder if your body could last the distance. It's gonna break because your spirits feel like it already did. Maybe that's why some of us drown ourselves in them. Because that's the only way to raise them when you're sinking. Because addiction is the only way you hold on to something. You see how just memories will on to you. The regrets, the comments, silences, the comments on your timeline, your voices. Be hurting in you. I feel like right. just on site. She looks depressed. She likes to be by himself. The regrets, what? The men who should go, the silences. Uh, like how they the do. Comments on your timeline. Using God's name in vain to say he created everyone the same. Not realizing there is a difference between equality and reality and how that affects your sanity while still having the audacity to treat like how they you do. Using this God's name in vain to say he created everyone the same. It doesn't matter. Not realizing there is a difference between equality and reality and how that affects your sanity while still having the audacity to treat you. Refine our senses. The science will find the weakest signs and learn the symptoms you don't mind. of being it quick matter. to define. Realize that some minds are more like minds that people trip by our lives. That's what we all do. We're all we waiting to the night fields of a war that is our senses, the sign of our minds to read the signs and learn the symptoms the instead of being pushed in one else around. Realize that some minds are more like minds that can be tripped by our lives. We're all put outside that ring. We want even to battlefields of a war that is lost on that door. That door side. Leave them because we were too afraid to listen, to look at ourselves, only to ask too late. What did you say? What did she say? Stigma is the law we put we outside that. What did we do? There's a label that we put on that door saying, leave them. Instead of because we were too afraid to listen, to look at ourselves, only to ask too late. What did he mean? What did she say? Why did we see? What did we do? Instead of just asking. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. All right, so as you're watching the video, what was the first thing that crossed your mind? Do you guys watch the video? <laughs> <laughs> Anything that crossed your mind as you were watching it? So real. 
Very real? Very dark? Okay. Stigma is very real, yeah? What else? Maybe some lessons? Don't look at you? Okay. All right. Never mind. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for all the contribution. Okay. Now, stigma is obviously very real, right? But sometimes, because it's so real, then the condition seems unreal, right? So we want to talk a little bit about that, guys. So this is typically some of the things that we hear in daily conversations, not done deliberately, but because of the lack of knowledge. This is typ typically what we hear in um, daily conversations. Crazy, right? The person's crazy, psycho lah, kan? Gila, ah, tu kita biasa dengar, kan? Man up. Uh, that's why men don't want to reach out, right? Because we judge them the moment they become vulnerable. In koni bunda na gay na jendu. He is just weak, dangerous. Orang lain lagi susah. Dia kena ingat Tuhan. Seriously, what's wrong with her? Don't mind them. Just get over it. So it's very much linked to weaker faith, not praying hard enough. Whatever religion you know you might be. Tak baca Quran, tak pergi church, you know, all those kind of things. And then, because of the lack of knowledge, then toxic positivity comes in, right? Not done deliberately again, but because of the lack of knowledge, this is the things that we utter, you know, when we talk to someone with mental health challenges. I'll just skip that. Okay. Now, when we... Okay, sorry. Okay, so... A little bit about Miyasa before I proceed, um, so that we all understand a little bit better if you are struggling or if your loved ones are struggling, that this is some of the services that we offer, right? So we've got peer support, family support, we've got WhatsApp support group, we've got 24-7 crisis helpline, and also WhatsApp. More art-based classes, so we've got art, drama, dance, we do spiritual therapy as well. We've got psychological services, so various kinds of therapy, counseling, awareness programs, and we also have supported employment um, programs and also a 24-7 chat bot. Now, you can take a picture or you can memorize because the number is really e easy. So it's a 24-7 crisis helpline, 1-800-1-800-66. And also our crisis WhatsApp line, which is 97656088. Okay? This is manned by our crisis team members, volunteers, all of them. The majority are people with lived experience. We also have a Miyasa chat bot, which is a collaboration with Meta. And also our WhatsApp channel, a one-way communication. So if you want more updates, you want to learn about mental health, you can also follow us on WhatsApp. And just to give you a little bit of insights, guys, what are we looking at? You know, people that are struggling in the community. These are the numbers right here. And so that is why mental health NGOs on the ground, we are very much overstretched and also overburdened. Um, although, alhamdulillah, we're able to normalize this discussion uh, very much. But when a lot of people reach out for the help, we're not able to cater for the demand. And so we constantly need help. So if you have time, you can volunteer as well. Now, to give you a little bit of um, insights of the situation in Malaysia, we are looking at 29.2% of Malaysians struggling with mental health issues. Not yet a mental health condition, but if you don't take care of your mental health, if enough factors are present, it can, de it can then develop and become a mental health condition. And I think when we talk about issues, uh, what has um, exacerbated all these mental health struggles, especially during this pandemic, um, these are obviously some of the things that I think we are all fully aware, right? A lot of people lost jobs during the pandemic. A lot of people lost loved ones during the pandemic. We were living in isolation. We were cut off from our social support system. And a lot of that really exacerbated a lot of the mental health struggles for many of us, especially, you know, those that were living alone or have really poor coping mechanisms. So now, coming back to the conversation of uh, mental health, this is what we are really struggling with at the moment. When we lack the knowledge, this is when the perception that we hold as a wider society, and this is what we see um, a lot. You know, people with mental health conditions are dangerous, violent. If you don't take medication, you kill someone, or you have tendencies to kill another person, or you can't get well, or you're always sick. 
So it builds that stereotype and that prejudice and then exclusion and stigma happens. And so the, this is typically what we are looking at um, currently um, in Malaysia. So people with schizophrenia especially. So a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of times when we talk about mental health, we always imagine a person with a schizophrenia and a person that is extremely dangerous and violent. So this is um, typically the, the perception of the wider society. And this is not from me, it's actually from data. And people are to be blamed of their condition. People with mental health conditions don't normally recover. Um, so these are some perceptions. And there's also a lot of misunderstandings when it comes to cultural um, reasons, right? So when you have a mental health condition, you're weak will, or you know, a demon possessed you, as an example, or divine punishment or sickness of the soul, it's not regarded as a medical condition, but it's really regarded as something very negative. And there's also inaccurate uh, perceptions, right? So people think that if you're weak, then you develop a mental health condition. That means, uh, as an example, you're weak-willed, right? Um, or you're not resilient, and that's why you get a mental health condition. And if you look at the data right here, guys, 50% of Malaysians actually believe that when it comes to mental health disorders, the sufferer is to be blamed for their condition. And 80% believe that there is no such thing as a mental health problem. Of course, it's 2023. Um, I think this is not valid anymore. We all went through the pandemic. We all today know that mental health challenges, challenges are true, right? And of course, portrayal by the media. Um, this is something that we see improving a lot, right? Because prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of inaccuracy when it comes to portrayal of people living with mental health conditions within films and dramas and music videos and songs and even um, news reporting, right? And it always ends with tragedy or it always ends with violence, right? We don't portray the person with a mental health condition, with you know the depth of their experiences, that they can actually succeed despite their mental health challenges. So this is not the portrayal that we see often um, in movies. And of course, one of the things that is very harmful when we hold such perceptions is people then internalize the stigma, and this is when they struggle alone and in silence, and this is when the unimaginable act of suicide happens, right? Because they believe that nobody, you know, wants to help them out or it's not, you know, they're not worth it, nobody loves them, and then it becomes very impulsive because suicide is very complex, right? You know, you don't wake up in the morning and you just feel like you want to die. A lot of things must happen, a lot of factors must be present, then only, um, you know, the suicidal thoughts or tendencies come in. Now, what are the challenges that are faced by the B40 community? Now, 80% of our clients at Miasa belong from this group, right? So we do a lot of outreach to more, you know, marginalized, vulnerable, vulnerable communities, and we work a lot with the homeless folks on the streets. If you've never interacted or helped or support um, a person within or people within these communities, uh, please do come and join us, um, and that way we will really understand the challenges and what the reality on the ground is, what, what, what it looks like. So Dr. Zaliha, who is our um, health minister, said, among the factors that contribute to these issues are pressure from parents and poor relationship with peers. And this is um, when we talk about anxiety and depression. Now, when we talk about mental health, Mental health isn't merely a healthcare issue. It is a social justice issue. And until we can address these issues, not everyone's recovery journey is going to be successful, right? So what are we looking at? It's not just about accessing healthcare. It's not just about accessing mental health care. But we are looking at all these things, right? Fairer social systems, transportation, access to education, employment, housing, access to information, and, and of course, language barrier. So a lot of the B40 communities, these are the challenges that they face. And when we talk about the gaps, there are multiple gaps currently within the mental health system in Malaysia. And the problem with these gaps existing is this. When you live with a mental health condition, and let's say it's severe, right? And you don't get the help, you don't get the support, you don't have the, a job. What happens is you fall within the gaps of, these, of the mental health system, and then you end up homeless on the streets. 
or you end up incarcerated in prison, or you end up in a mental institution. And then it reinforces stigma because then people say, Bonita, see, I told you, people with mental health condition can't recover, right? So I just want us to highlight that when a person is homeless on the street, when the person is struggling with a mental health condition, the first thing that needs to happen is we must provide a roof on top of their heads, right? You know, a lot of times people tell me, but the person needs to recover first. What if they're going through addiction? You know, what if they're going through suicidal tendencies? Yes, but we must understand where these mental health condition, you know, where does it stem from? You know, what, are, what is the trauma? What are their challenges? And a lot of them, it's all financial difficulties, right? And so everything begins with a roof on top of a person's head and connecting, connecting them to jobs. So we want to really highlight that employment, housing, and then of course transportation. You know, a lot of people come to us and say, oh, we provide food and drinks and hygiene products at you know, this location. But how does a homeless person get there? How does a person within the B40 community does it, that earns five ringgit a day, how do they come to you and get these food and drinks that they don't have, right? So transportation is also an issue. Social welfare, accessibility to healthcare and education and language barriers. So I want to show you this graph right here so that we have a better understanding on what it looks like when we talk about mental health, right? Now, in Malaysia, a mental health condition is treated as a specialized illness, as a specialized condition. So it is limited to clinical psychiatrists and clinical psychologists treating them. But the moment you step out of Malaysia, it is actually part of public health. So if you're struggling with a mental health challenge, you can actually walk in into a health clinic or your own GP, you know, a private clinic, and you can get the help that you need, right? But then because of the lack of knowledge as well, a lot of people, when they step into a health clinic or their own GP, they don't really know how to reach out for the help, you know? Because you don't say things like, oh, I think I have a mental health issue you come in with physical manifestation, right? Symptoms, uh, dog, you know, I don't feel too good, you know, I've got a headache, I've got a tummy ache, and you say, okay, let's, let me give you a Panadol, right? You don't come in and necessarily know what to say when you are going through a mental health issue. So our health clinics at the moment, we only have about 400 what we call family medicine specialists that are trained in mental health that know how to help and provide intervention for people that are struggling in the community. and. Unfortunately, as well, we're looking at right now, if you look on this side of, um, of the presentation, well, look at this side first, sorry. You'll see that psychiatric units within general hospitals, they actually manage 90% of all new patients. They manage 83% of all follow-ups, and they manage 75% of all admissions. So you can actually see how within the psychiatric units in general hospitals, they are the ones that help the bulk of people that are struggling with mental health conditions. Padahal, in our primary care unit, which we have 1,000 health clinics in Malaysia, we've got 7,000 GPs, six to 7,000 GPs in Malaysia, we're not accessing these services that we currently have. Right, so this is the problem and the struggle at the moment. People, you know, based on data that was done um, from Harvard University in 2016 with the Ministry of Health, they found, based on their survey and research, that 50% of Malaysians, if you go through a mental health struggle, the first person that you would be in touch with is your GP, right? But then GPs are not trained in it, so they don't know how to provide that help for people that are struggling in the community. Now, remember I spoke about how a person with a mental health condition, when they don't get the help and treatment, loved ones die, they fall, within the gaps of the mental health system, and then they become incarcerated or being put in, in um, institutions. Now, this is what it is right here. There's four institutions still standing in Malaysia. If we remember, do you guys remember when we were in um, the lockdown, the first three months? Imagine how we felt during the time. Imagine being ill and being confined in your own house. How does a person get better? So people with severe mental health conditions, this is what happened to, to them till today. They're being institutionalized, okay? So a lot of forced treatments, a lot of uh, coercive practices and treatments um, are imposed upon these people and there's no data, there's no research to support that these forced treatments helps a person in their recovery process. In contrary, 
there's a lot of data and evidence to show that it is harmful and detrimental to a person's recovery and mental health. So I would like to end with this. So if you look at the situation in Malaysia right now, people that are homeless on the streets, if they have a mental health condition, this is when they become invisible, right? No shelter home in Malaysia takes in a person that is homeless with a mental health condition in. The moment you have a mental health condition label on your forehead, nobody takes you in, right? This is the unfortunate truth and reality of what is happening in Malaysia. Now let me tell you, these people that you see on the streets, you see them talking to the wall, talking to themselves. If you give them treatment help from a holistic approach, if you give them support, they can become one of us. They can recover and they can lead quality of lives, quality lives. But we are not giving that, them their right. We're not giving them the opportunity to recover at the moment. During COVID in Seremban, um, under YB Nicole, they actually formed a really small shelter home uh, for people homeless on the streets with a mental health condition, more like a transition home. And right now, they are taking in people with mental health conditions. I think it's limited for men, only about 20 beds um, at the moment. So this is really what happens, guys. Just imagine a person homeless on the street, unwell. So Miyasa calls um, the ambulance, or we bring them to the hospital. They get the treatment. But they are only allowed to stay there for a little while because they don't bring income to the hospital, right? And then they become stable, and then they're discharged back to the streets. And then the reoccurrence of episodes happen again, and then they relapse again. So this is the reality of what happens right now on the ground, not in Africa, in Malaysia. Okay, so this is why Miyasa, we are currently trying to, or striving to establish a crisis home. Because we've tried our best to, you know, really to do a lot of things, but unfortunately sometimes we reach a dead end. So one of the things that we're trying to do right now is a collaboration with Food For You, which provides food and drinks to the homeless folks in, at Chow Kid, that we want to form a crisis home so that people have a place to go. There is an opportunity for them to recover, get jobs, you know, get housing, get better, and they know that they are accepted in society and then they can lead quality, you know, quality lives, they can contribute to society and they're given that right and opportunity like everyone else. And this is one of the models. Um, okay, sorry, I will end here. So I lied earlier. Um, so this is the Trieste model in Italy. And the reason why I want to end here is because this is true. I've been here. Uh, I was in Trieste, Italy in 2019. I was invited to speak on no, no restraints and the good practices when it comes to mental health. And in Trieste, let me tell you, in Italy, they closed down mental institutions institutions in the 1970s. They invested in mental health, community mental health, 24-7. And until today, they have been able to reduce suicide by 50%, guys, 5-0. If you go to Trieste, people with mental health conditions, they live within the normal people. Right? They work in cafes, they work in hotels, they even run hotels. Um, and they live among the normal people. And this is what we would like to achieve in Malaysia as well. The forensic ward, let me tell you, the forensic ward in Trias, it is in an open forensic ward. And this is what we're really hoping. We are hoping for more investments in community support services so that ultimately one day mental institutions in Malaysia can close down and people with mental health conditions can recover effectively in the community amongst family, friends, and things that can help them, inshallah. So I think that's all. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dean. Thank you so much, uh, uh Indeed, that's, that's very eye-opening, right? Like to sort of like, you know, then understand uh, the underlying uh, problems and, and how we can actively help uh, these people and make, you know, uh, Malaysia a better place for uh, everyone in that sense. Right, uh, so, yep, understanding that, uh, and, and, you know, I don't want everyone to feel like, you know, all 
of uh, doom and gloom uh, in that sense, right? Because uh, there's so much more uh, to it, right? Because the objective today is to uh, destigmatize, like, you know, mental health uh, discussion. And for that, we have uh, an activity uh, that we're going to do, right? So I uh, want to get uh, ourselves, like, you know, uh, active a little bit and, and you know, be involved uh, in sort of like, you know, discussing uh, mental health issue more actively in that sense. So with that, I am going to call uh, Dr. Lilani Momano, the founder and certified practitioner of Riders and Elephants, uh, as well as David Ngu, the co-founder of But Honestly, right, to sort of like, you know, then uh, do this uh, panel discussion and activity uh, on mental health icebreaker session and getting to know your colleagues at Workspace, right? So how then do we create this, you know, healthy uh, workspace so that, you know, uh, it, it's not so hostile at workplace and if we have problems, how do we then address it healthily in that sense? So, yep, uh, can I have Dr. Lelani and David? Assalamualaikum. And a very good afternoon. So, let's see right here. So, the purpose uh, for today's session, you know, um, what I'm going to share with you is, um, I want to advocate that let's all of us have, as I say here, meaningful conversation, mindful communication. Yeah, so it's so important how we interact at the office. Yeah, um, whether you are a middle management or you are, you know, a senior management team or, you know, you are a team that supports, yeah, um, the entire um, ice lango, yeah, uh, we always need to have uh, meaningful conversations. Next. Right, so, we are almost to 2024, right? And a research was done recently and they say that the demand for emotional intelligence will increase by six times. And this was done maybe about two years ago. Um, we are two months, three months to 2024. Um, it's so important that we um, understand and we know how to be more empathetic at work. Yeah? Um, of course, earlier on when we have uh, Pon Anita talking about uh, mental um, health, yeah, and, and being empathetic is perhaps one of the first way, yeah, first step, yeah, for us to really listen and have meaningful conversations. Right. Next. So um, later on, we'll play a game, and this is the card, yeah, and we'll play a game on um, how we can be more empathetic at work. But let's look at um, the research here. Eighty percent of competencies. Yeah, it's very much related to emotional intelligence. Yeah, so if you are an accountant here, if you are an engineer here, 20% is what is needed for you to do your task. Yeah, 80% is your emotional intelligence. How you bring teams together, how you negotiate with your vendors, how do you keep to the timeline, yeah, um, it's 80% of that. And that's why, for us, we are advocating for a more empathetic um, uh, workplace. And uh, we can see here that when it comes to high-performing teams, right, we see that 90% uh, uh, of high performers, they actually have high emotional intelligence. Right? Next. So I want to share with you uh, this research which was done by Gartner. Um, and it says here that, you know, as we approach uh, 2024 and beyond, when it comes to role model behavior, the first column here, it's very much personal, yeah? It's very much you making sure that you have a safe place to express yourself. And that's, this is what I guess Anita is talking about also earlier on. You know, having that safe place to communicate, having that safe place to say, yeah, perhaps this is not the idea that we need to, you know, uh, dwell on. Perhaps let's look at another alternative. Yeah, you have that safe place to, to say that. And when it comes to support teams, we have to understand that we cannot, certainly cannot 
put aside what happens at home and say, when I walk into the office, I will leave all my troubles away, you know, and, and come to the office. No, we are human beings, right? Our problems, our issues, our challenges are with us. And when you leave the office, it's also impossible for you not to bring it back home, right? So, the support team, and I, I believe all of you here are part of this Sembang Kalau Bimbang, yeah? And uh, we all need to understand that we need to, you know, be able to support each other, yeah? Um, address life needs. And finally, when we need to deliver results, yeah? Um, we have to have what we call this individualized way of managing tailored, flexible workflow. Alright, so again, when we have meaningful conversation, mindful communication, inshallah, we'll be able to achieve uh, such results. Next. So, hearing people out, listening to your team members, it's so important to help them to feel appreciated to help you to feel very much appreciated. And you as leaders, I believe some of you here are leaders, it's so important for you to manage your own emotion. Your emotion matters too, and it is as, as important as how you manage your team's emotion. All right, so later on we'll play a game, and we'll see how you can manage your emotion as a leader, and how you can manage the team's emotion. Next. That's it. So I call upon David. Come. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Leila. Wow, isn't it awesome that we can have the chance to gather together today? So we just give a round of applause for Ayah Salamo. We love you, Bob. So getting us all together here for such a beautiful event. Well, and I just want to say thank you for all coming today as well. You guys are here for a purpose, and we believe that we're going to have a great time together. All right? So let's just do another clap for Juan Anita. Juan Anita has given us such an insightful, uh, all the data, all the information, and you can see how um, Dr. Liliana has also given us all that kind of information, the 90%, the 83%, the 25%, yeah? I also have the some numbers as well. So, but honestly, we have like 90% of people also having a lot of fun with our card game, and also 85 people, 85% uh, of people also enjoy the dating events. Uh, as you can tell, the numbers are rounded off because, of course, there's not in my head. All, <laughs> all the data is very specific given by them. So, before we want to go into something, I just want to give you guys a little bit of a heads up. Right, we are going to be very vulnerable today. And with the space of opening up, this is the basis of Bad Honesty. And with our picture here, this is our card. The basis of Bad Honesty is founded with the intention of being vulnerable. And if you speak, maybe you say vulnerable three times, you probably create a new word, right? Because it's so alien to us. And if you want to try and take it up a notch, you can say vulnerability three times, and you might create a new language. So if you were to try with me, I would like you to enjoy the time with us together here today, and I would like you to also participate in vulnerability with me. Shall we do that, everyone? Yes. Can we do a good hands up with a dominant hand? If you are here listening to my voice, you can do it. Awesome. <laughs> now, with the time that we have with a practice of vulnerability, I would love for you to all respect everyone in the same space here by bowing your heads and closing your eyes. Well, don't worry, your personal belongings are in your pocket. You do not need to worry about me going to you. As mentioned by Juan Anita, I can only move one step from this podium. But no worries, I'm just joking. But every one of you, if you can close your eyes and bow your heads, please do not take a snooze. You will be listening to my voice and I'll be asking you three questions for you today. Practice vulnerability. Shall we do that? Everyone, if your eyes closed, I can see you. I can see you. Close your eyes. If you, may, if you want to bow your head to close up the distractions, you may. And with the sound of my voice, I would like to ask you the first question. How many of you are involved in a major project, something big you have done before? If you have done it before, I want you to raise your hand. Raise it up high. Take your time, raise your hand. Close your eyes. Okay, you can put down your hands. How many of you 
would have think that you have done a good job in that event? Raise your hand. And the last question, how many of you would think that you have done a bad job? Raise your hand. Thank you very much. Raise your hands right now. You can open your eyes, lift up your heads, take a deep breath. You have just practiced the vulnerability. You guys are strong. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> well, if you do feel that, and certainly in your heart, you do feel a certain rush, right? But if the question is being asked, you know what's happening in you. And with the same question that I asked, the first question that was being asked, how many of you felt all oh, you know have been done in a big project before? Almost a few. I would say, with the numbers again, 70% of the room has raised their hands. And the second question has asked, how many of you think that you have done a good job? And some of your assumptions, I would say, is correct. Only about three or four hands have raised their hand. Three or four. And the last question, how many of you here think, they think that you have done a bad job? We have less than numbers, all right? Two, not to say that everyone has done a good job or a bad job, but to say that you are practicing vulnerability in three levels. But honestly, it has been created in vulnerability in three levels. Level one, level two, and level three. Level one is the same question that I asked you before, but it's something for you to easy to understand to raise your hand. The second question gets into something a little bit more vulnerable for you to actually expose yourself. Have you done a good job? Maybe. And the last question, have you done a bad job? Some of you might have heard the laughter that it is an internal representation of what we feel. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to answer that. And that's level three. So to start off with a conversation with you, instead of giving the stats and numbers, I became CEO of Bart Honestly in just less than a month. And Bart Honestly is all about vulnerability and sharing your experiences, sharing a safe space, but I couldn't feel that. In fact, I feel like an imposter. I didn't know what to do, or is there a right way to do things? I went to read, I went to research, I went to do a lot of things to try to get myself up back up because I couldn't find myself to be the CEO of a vulnerability, a safe space company. I can't represent that. And sooner or later, I realized that I need to open up. Having a time for myself and as she's talking to my friends, I realized that, but honestly, it's a lifestyle. And if that, I want to end with a cliffhanger. So 30 minutes later, we'll have a time together. I will share more with you, but honestly, thank you very much. And I hope that every one of you here will open your heart for a safe space for everyone to experience vulnerability and a safe space for you to share. Thank you very much. We'll see you next in the next session. Thank you. Hard for a safe space for. Uh, 
Okay. 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 Bimbang uh, with Brendan Ho. Uh, and last but not least, we have Shaifa Aliyah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Alright, so uh, I suppose, like, you know, uh, to start off, uh, let's uh, sort of like, okay, uh, you, you both can, uh, yeah, have, have that microphone. Uh, and then we were sharing, like, sharing is caring, right? Okay. So let's start off with uh, Sam. Right, uh, and I suppose you have uh, a lot of uh, fans in the house, okay? Uh, and, and and maybe, maybe, right? Uh, because I think like, any anyone have seen uh, Beckham uh, on Netflix? Yeah. The yeah. 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 Uh, I I've seen it as well, right? I've watched it, and 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 only after watching it, then you get to see from his point of view, right? Because all the while, like, you know, we, we read the media and whatnot, and we're like, oh, right? And then we get to see that from his point of view. So, so me, maybe, like, you know, from your point of view and, you know, your experience, I know you are a, a great, like, goalkeeper, okay? Not that I want football. Uh... I definitely think the modern era, um, Edison from Manchester City is, is you've seen his distribution and... Like I said, they, they don't get used as goalkeepers anymore, but for, for, for sure him, um, as I was growing up younger, not being the tallest of goalkeepers, I, I admire Ike Casillas for Real Madrid, um, a, gr a great a legend of a goalkeeper, so um, he was definitely one that was a role model growing up. Right, right. I'm nodding. <laughs> but I don't know any of these people. I was expecting like you know Rihanna, Lady Gaga. Good, right? But like yeah. Oh, because, okay. So I mean, like to be honest, right? To be honest, whenever you watch football, like you know, the stars will always be Beckham, uh, Ronaldinho, and stuff like that. Like goalkeepers have never been the star, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, right? Don't trigger me. Don't trigger me. Right? <laughs> I'm being vulnerable here. Okay, so like, okay, maybe, maybe from from my point of view, right? Like, you know, I I have not seen like you know goalkeeper as a star. Like, what why why do you think that is? I don't, I don't know. We're always we're always um, we're always the last man on the field, right? So um, if you're a striker, you have the midfield behind you. If you're a midfielder, you've got the defense. And if you're the defender, you've got us. So. I, I feel like for a goalkeeper, you have to have big shoulders. Because, right. you know, if we make a mistake on the pitch, it's normally 95% ends in a goal. So, um, my father always taught me this growing up, that you have to have big shoulders being a, a goalkeeper and, and deal with the, the pressure. You almost feel like a, you have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. so, I don't know why, maybe we're not the ones scoring the goals, getting the credit, you know, but saving saving a shot that's yeah. point blank is, is just as good, for me, it's just as good as scoring a goal. Yeah. 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 Yes, of now, when we were younger, right, we would play like, bola sepak, bola kampung, it's always the guy who cannot play the fat fella, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. Yeah. It's never the star, you know. That's True, the, this is actually that. how I started, you know. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of triggers being up here, huh? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. One second. Last morning, huh? No, no, seriously. No, no, this is, this is how I started, seriously. Yeah, I, I wanted to join a, a football team. I, I used to go to like a soccer school and I wanted to join a football team and they asked me to come and play in a tournament. I played a few games on pitch and they told me to go and go and then I was quite good in go. And then I think it was because I wasn't good on pitch. So and that's, how I, that's how I started. All right. Okay. So from from football, let's let's move to like you know the base world, right? Like with with Brendan first, right? So as a content creator, a host, who do you look up to? I remember when I was younger, uh, you know, watching American Idol, Ryan Seacrest was massive. Okay, I know. Yeah, that. you know Ryan yes. Seacrest. Yeah. So so that was one of the guys that I really look up uh, to. I mean, but that's overseas lah. Locally, I would say like people like um, I grew up with people like Abang Nas. Uh, and it, I think it's a very familiar. I see some people nodding. Um, people like uh, Jian, Supri Jian, 
And uh, yeah, pretty much uh, it was Ryan Seekers who my cockpit when I went for audition on the ATP Quickie. Uh, he was literally the guy like, you know, I was pretending that I was an American Idol host. Um, so yeah, these are some of the people that I look up to as a host and uh, just to improve my craft and improve on how to be a great host, you know, and things like that. So uh, it's fun, it's fun. Yeah, just realized that I'm 30 this year and I started when I was 20. My gosh, it's just been 10 years. That's so, I'm so old. So Leah, like, you know, for you, like, you know, in terms of... Uh, I'm 40 this year, by the way. Like, <laughs> yeah. Who do you look up to? Uh, it's so funny that you mentioned those two names. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you, Aislam, for doing this. It's awesome. And Dean, you are... Uh, I love you now. <laughs> I love you. The whole, I'm nodding, and I'm like, yes, kindred spirits. <laughs> love it. But yes, no, goalkeepers, I don't do sports, but I, I have uh, the utmost respect for goalkeepers because the agility that you guys have to have, you guys not only have... <laughs> Hello, abang jahat tau. Okay, you not only have to have the uh, sights, you also need to have the foresight in the sense where you need to budget where these players are going beforehand. So, like that, <laughs> keep, keep doing you and yeah, all the best, abang. Tak boleh bang, macam ni bang. Dia macam terlalu timbul. Okey ke? Jangan gula kasar bang. <laughs> Oh, okay, that's not me, control. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, that's good. So, yeah, and uh, I love the fact that you mentioned uh, Nas, yeah, Nas and, yeah, let's try that. Nas and um, Jen. Yeah. Because I, and the fact that you're old, you feel old. Yeah, I worked with both. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, oh, gee. Oh, gee. Yes, I worked with Jen during Malaysian Idol, mm -hmm. uh, the first season, and of course, uh, Abang Nas is also a, f a long time family friend. So, uh, yes, they're both amazing. Um, uh, who do I look up to? Oh, so many people. Um, especially the women figures. In I mean, I, I, Anita Abu Bakar is one of the women that I have looked up to for so long. Because in case you didn't know, uh, Puan Anita is also the founder of Kaiser, mm. uh, so which is a publication uh, for a lot of the books that were not accessible to us. Uh, to um, I don't want to use the term liberal, but yeah, uh, to Muslims who would want who wanted books, you know, who wanted more information, you know. So yeah, so at the time we had social media, which ah, baru nak pasang kan. So yeah. Uh, Kaiser was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, yeah, a lot of women, Kak Fad, um, in the industry, it's my mother, yeah. you know, um, these women who may not have saved goals for states or have hosted like thousands and hundreds and thousands of people, uh, an audience of a hundred and thousands of people, but these women who basically have pushed through despite everything that has been put on them um, since birth really, you know, you, you're born a woman, you're born a girl, so chop, this is your lot in life. And despite that, they've not only owned it, they've been, they rocked it. And they've set a standard for so many other women in, in, in Malaysia, in, in, in the world actually, so these women are I have so many idols, so these women are there. Right. Yeah, you're right. They might not save goals, but they have goals in life. Oh, yeah. Right. And they have set goals for us. True. It's not just making a certain person happy, it's making everybody happy. And more importantly, to make us happy, to make True. ourselves happy. So that's amazing, yeah. Right. So, and, and, and my next round, right, like, uh, I want to take inspiration from David earlier, right, to be vulnerable. Right. right? So, Sam, from you. On a scale from 1 to 10, right, in what you do, how would you rate yourself? Oh. <laughs> there you go, yes! <laughs> I think there's a, there's a fine line between you know, self-confidence and arrogance. So, right. Um, 
I'm fully aware that on a global scale, um, in terms of Barclays Premier League, you know, I've got a lot, a lot of work to do. So, in terms of local football, I'm first choice goalkeeper for one of the biggest clubs in the country. So, um, yeah, I, I know to get to that level, but I've got a lot of work to do. And in terms of career-wise, like where do you think you are at right now? I'm, I'm always striving for, for, for perfection, so, um, and I'm never going to get there. So, but I'm always working hard. I'm doing extras. Um, I speak to a psychologist once a month to, mm -hmm. to fight my demons and, and you know clear my head and make sure my head's in the right space to perform. Mm. All right, Brendan. One, two, one to ten. ten. Yeah. Like, do we need to, like, you know, like, close our eyes, like, go down, and just like, bow our heads and close our eyes? I think I would say, like, um, probably, like, maybe six or seven. I would say, like, maybe a solid seven. Yeah, like, I know there are things that I can improve on, things that I want to do more, things I wish I had done more as well. Uh, but, in, you know, in terms of, I would say I'm contented in many ways. I'm very blessed to be able to do what I do, and for that, I'm very grateful. So, yeah, so the fact that I can at least still... I mean, I guess my, not to say my goals are not big or anything like, but, but I'm quite a simple man. Um, you know, I can afford the little joys in life. I can, big one, keep my wife happy. Um, that That's a big plus for me. Um, so yeah, so on, on, on that front, I would say like a solid seven. Yeah. All right. Oh, Leah, one to ten. Okay, I have to, sorry, <laughs> bad habit. <laughs> I'm usually on that side of the... <laughs> I feel like that hari ni lah macam ayah terkekir, main ni lah, kau jawab soalan, kau jawab, bukan orang tanya. Bukan orang tanya. Awal-awal tadi macam lah, are you okay with that? Uh, I, like, uh, I don't know how to answer, okay. So, uh, what, one to ten of what, actually? So, if, if you were to rate yourself, like, you know, In, what you do? Uh, what I do? Yeah. Right now, answering uh, questions, maybe one. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> you are like asking questions. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so um, I sub, uh, uh, just a brief background. Like, and oh. I've, I've, uh, I've recently been diagnosed with ADHD. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I explained so much of my life. <laughs> my 40 years of living suddenly, ah, I found out now. Uh, but yeah, so um, there are many aspects of me uh, in life. Mm -hmm. And I, that's why I keep... Um, I think uh, it was RJ, we asked a certain question earlier and then we were like, okay, what day? Uh, you know, how I feel. Uh, what? The question was what, how, if, how I feel, uh, that, but I don't want to or something like that. Okay, it depends on what day, what time, where the sun is and whether the aircon is on full. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, currently in life in general, Alhamdulillah, Allah it is at a nice seven, I think, mm -hmm. I would say. Uh, you know, I have a supportive husband, I have... Like, my God, noisy children. <laughs> really noisy children. Uh, and it's a busload. Eh? So, <laughs> okay, I've got four. So, um, uh, a paying job, an awesome boss, uh, and my family, well, you all know how my family is. We are dysfunctional, but we are very close-knit. What you see is what you get. We are like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Alhamdulillah, said. All right. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now uh, back to Sam, right? Uh, understanding, like you know, uh, where uh, you are at and whatnot, and you know, as a pro athlete yourself, right? Like you know, and and like what you said as well, you are a perfectionist, and by that definition, I suppose, like you are your own enemy in that sense, right? Because you always want to strive for the best, you always want to be a better version of you uh, in that sense. So, how do you keep up with that? pressure of performing at such a high level, uh, like, you know, every day? Um, I think it's just remembering, you know, it's another game of football. It's just another game of football. It helps take the pressure off. I've, I've done this for years before getting paid, mm -hmm. um, before it was my job. So it's just, I kind of think back to a more of a less pressure environment when I was doing it as a kid, even though there's 20,000 people watching these days and, and on TV and uh, I should remember why I started to, to make my family proud um, and, and just to do the thing I love 
Right, and, and you were sharing earlier about like, you know, how you, you've had this experience with Arsenal, Chelsea and Reddings as well, like, you know, when you first started back in the UK. Maybe you want to like, you know, share with us a little bit about that. Yeah, obviously I'm, I'm mixed Malaysian, so I'm half British, half Malaysian. Um, I moved here when I was 21, uh, alone with, with no family. I used to come here for, for holidays, but um, the reason I kind of came over here to play football was uh, I got quite a lot of knockbacks in England with my height. So for a goalkeeper, they have a template where you now have to be like six foot two plus four. They even consider you. So um, even from 15 years old, I was I trialed at these clubs, Arsenal, Chelsea, and a lot of them were turning around saying, technically you are you are good, but you are not going to be six foot four. And they said we can we can teach technique, but we cannot teach you how to be tall. So that was the struggles I faced growing up, um, and it. It took me to take a different career path and look at the football scene over here, um, and, and and obviously a new goal. Right, right. And would 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 then be your biggest fear as 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 a goalkeeper, as an athlete, like you know that you could never be taller than what you are now, and you know the limitations that you have to be a goalkeeper. It was definitely an insecurity growing up, um, but. I wouldn't say it's my biggest fear because there's things you can do and train to combat your height. I can work on my footwork, which will make me quicker and more explosive, which will make me save the balls like a six foot two goalkeeper would. Um, if I'm more powerful than my legs, I can jump the same height uh, mm -hmm. as them, if not if not higher. So my I wouldn't say that's my biggest fear, but my biggest fear is I, I don't want to look back on my career and wish I could have done more. Mm -hmm. um, right. I, w I would hate to be 40 and my body can't do what it does now and then I wish I would have worked harder. I wish I would have had a cleaner diet. Right. Um, that would be my, my biggest fear of my, my career. All right, okay. Uh, so 10 more years for you, Brendan. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> right, so what would be... <laughs> 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 I, I am triggered with him saying like it's all at the age of 30. <laughs> so, so like... For you then, right, like what would be your fear or insecurities being like, you know, a content creator uh, or a host in that sense, right? I, I think we had, we had this discussion earlier where content creators these days have, have gotten like, you know, this negative light, right? Because, yeah. so as long as you can dance to like, you know, a stupid trend and you post it on TikTok, you're yeah. a content creator, yeah. right? Like, yeah. So. What would be your, you know, insecurities in that sense and fear as a 30-year-old host and content creator? <laughs> well, I think, um, I mean, when you talk about insecurities, you really have to go back in the past. Like, pretty much like how when Sam talks about his insecurities, like, you know, when he was younger, when he was a child. Uh, and, and it's the same with me, really. You know, when you want to talk about insecurities, you really got to go back in time and find out where these insecurities stem from. Um, so, so yeah, you know, for me, I, I, I actually grew up from a very humble background, so I grew up in a very poor family, and so the insecurity for me was always uh, wanting to, uh, I mean, I grew up with really low self-esteem, um, you know, not being confident at all, so it took many, many years to, to sort of uh, uh, come into my own in that sense, and uh, because I always, am, am coming from that background, you always want to please people, uh, that's a very common trait among people with low self-esteem and, you know, coming from a, a background of B40, of poverty. You kind of want you, you want to please everyone. And the unfortunate thing is that when you do content creation as well, it translates to everything. So you kind of want to please the audience, right? You want to you give what the audience want. And in the process of that, you can sometimes just lose yourself. Um, and you find out that the only person you're not pleasing is actually yourself. Yeah. And in that process, the more you are in that cycle and you realize that sooner or later you just fall out of love with it and you can actually just burn out. So I've burned out many times, I'm not afraid to say that. You know, I've just burned out so many times, punched the wall because I just didn't understand what, what, like, what the hell am I doing, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, so, so burnout is a, is a big thing as well for me. Um, so it's really, when you talk about biggest fear, biggest insecurity, is, 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 it comes from that place back then. And to know that, hey, you know, I'm not defined by who I was back then. Uh, I'm not defined by a life of poverty, you know. Uh, I'm not defined by having low self-esteem and being so afraid of what people think of me. So, 
uh, I would say like, wow, you know, today I'm like this super ultra confident guy. Uh, I obviously have grown a lot and uh, it's still always a WIP, right? Like, you know, it's like it's, he's working hard constantly. It's not that he's the first choice keeper and then all is well. Um, so yeah, so it's constantly a work in progress and that's what I'm also doing and thank God for a very good support system around me as well to help me. Yeah. Right. And, and Leah, like talking about that and interestingly, like, you, you've been open about like, you know, your uh, ADHD, right? Yeah. How, how did, you know, that come about? Like, you know, uh, and, and, and in that sense, what's your reaction when you found out at, you know, at, at, at this age? Okay, so I was... Um Kejap lagi macam emosi sekejap dengan dia orang punya cerita Okay, tak apa You guys nak macam pasal aku tahu tak So anyways uh, I will, okay so uh, it was the MCO um, uh, Fana, <laughs> Fani Lina um, The timeline is such where slightly before I think um, November of 2019 November, December-ish of 2019 I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety uh, which probably came from a host of nonsense, actually. Um, everything was, my world was basically just crumbling down bit by bit, overworked, burnout, uh, uh, at the point where um, I was like having constant conversations with God, questioning God, and you know, it's like, macam, I could like, macam crash, macam menunggu je di sambal gilat, macam tu. So, uh, after a while, my sister's, uh, saw that drastic change, so got me to go to a psychologist because you have to understand growing up, I was the son, I'm the eldest daughter, but I was the son, mm. so I cannot seem weak. But what Puan Anita said, you know, when you when you, you have that, right, you've 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 got that, yeah, I cannot, I cannot yeah. be weak, you know, and if I'm if I cry in front of people, that means I'm weak, uh, if I show you my vulnerability, I'm weak, uh, so. It was not posed upon me or forced upon me by my parents. It was just, I don't know how it just, I don't know, genetic ke apa tak tahu lah. But it was, that was what I was thinking. So um, they forced me to see a psychologist. Within the first 20 minutes with the psychologist, she had gotten me to do a test and everything. They, they, they spoke, well, right? 20 minutes, she's like, okay, this is the number of a psychiatrist. You need to be medicated, you need to be treated, so you need to go tomorrow. Ah. So I went, diagnosed with <laughs> depression and anxiety, and then MCO happened, so that was a very helpful. <laughs> mm, that was fantastic. So, like, macam yeah. But alhamdulillah, um, the support system that I had was uh, great enough. And then uh, two years ago, I think, 2021, 2021, 22, um, I was diagnosed with ADHD on, on camera. <laughs> <laughs> on camera, I was doing a show. Um, I was hosting a show with, uh, funnily enough, with Abang Naz's wife. Uh, Shani was producing. So yeah, uh, Shani was producing, and uh, she, so she was behind the camera. Um, the, the, sorry, at the control st uh, station, and this psychiatrist uh, who was the guest on the show uh, had already spent like two days during the recording with me. So she was talking and everything. She specializes in. Um, uh, What's it called? Neurodivergence and also dis uh, behavioral disorders. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, so, okay, so we were talking and th that day the subject was neurodivergence and behavioral uh, differences. And so we were talking and talking and and she's like, so yeah, you would suffer symptoms like this and this and then grow up feeling like this and then doing this and then there's masking and then what you know. And the, she was talking and I'm like, like the whole time, if you watch it again, you can see that <laughs> lightning look dia macam, oh, macam kesedaran tu nampak sangat. So yeah, um, and then after 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 that, subsequently I also met with her and yeah, I was ADHD lah. So basically, um, I don't know how I to describe the reaction I got when the depression and anxiety, it was like, bro, you know, um, I guess. Uh, but when I got the ADHD diagnosis, that was the, ah, so that's why I felt inept all of my life. That's why that, you know, every, everything that I've achieved and everything, can, it's always, uh, it's always somebody has done it better. 
And this is all in my head. It's not anybody around me. It's like everybody does it better. What I can do, they can do it better. Are you sure? You know, if somebody else is better at it, you know? Why don't you go with that person? Or like, um, oh, I'm having troubles, I'm having issues, I'm, I'm sad, I'm really sad, I cannot control this sadness, I don't understand this sadness. But you know what? They have more reason to be sad. So I have no right to be sad. So, don't. Uh, I've, I've literally never cried. Uh, I jarang sangat menangis kerana sedih atau sebab sakit. Okay? Uh, but I will cry when I'm angry. Uh, I, I, I only cry when I'm angry. When I'm really angry, so I, I cannot literally punch that person. Uh, that's when I cry. Yeah, obviously, lah, kan, kena tangkap polis. Uh, so, tak boleh. So, no, uh, I cannot attack people. Uh, so, yeah, so I will only cry. So, because crying would make me seem vulnerable, would seem weak. So, do you know what I mean or not? So, I, I tak boleh macam tu. My, my default is marah. Mm. Ah, mm. anger. Yeah. Ah, so when when I got the diagnosis, it's like, just, oh, so that was actually masking. Mm. Ah, you because I wanted to be accepted. You know, you like you don't understand me, so then mind I play to you what you need. Ah, what do you need? Mm. People pleaser. <laughs> ah, sebenarnya dekat dalam tu meronta, merentan, merana. <laughs> Tapi tak apa. <laughs> ah, cerita. You know what I mean? Ah, so, but, and and with with that does it now mm -hmm. like you know uh, how does it, how does it change now now that you know right do you then look back and you're just like oh and and you're doing things okay. differently now the difference before diagnosis and after diagnosis is before diagnosis when people tell me you know what you are so much more capable of doing this yeah. you have this you have you can do so much more you are doing so much better you are you are fantastic you are great in my head you'll be like <laughs> whatever you're the lulu. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, like, yeah, yeah. I know my level. But now, when my husband says, you're selling yourself short again. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. Alright, I gotta stop that. Uh, you know, uh, so it's, uh, it's like, uh, okay, I, I, I cannot fall back. Then, like, I'm ADHD, uh, I got mental health issues. Cannot every day. Mm. Cannot, cannot. I'm selling myself short. Mm. I do not deserve this. Mm. Uh, I deserve this. Uh, you know, so like, uh, kena dengan cakap lah. Uh, mm. Padahal dulu mak dah cakap <laughs> My mother, God help her God, God love her, Alhamdulillah um, Since I was in my teens She's like, do you want to go to see a specialist? I really think you have ADHD Tapi tak nak uh, said, <laughs> No, <laughs> I tak nak Ah, The girl Sebab tak nak lemah hmm. Mana boleh ya? Tak, ya, tak mau, tak mau, tak mau, tak mau. Uh, So bila dapat diagnosis tu My mother macam, hmm Ah, eh, 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 buat peti mak, gegar pula aku <laughs> Tapi betul lah, tu lah cakap, tengah cakap mak eh mm. <laughs> ah, Tu lah Right, right, and like then with Brendan right Like we understand like you know how then you know Leah sort of like you know work through like you know uh, Her situations and like you know, insecurities and things like that Like with you, how, how do you manage that? I think while, while she was sharing I was like so worried about myself. Oh my god, we. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, it was not like, like me. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, you know, when I was hearing sharing, I was like, I can identify. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like I could identify so much. I was like, oh my gosh, maybe I should go and see a psychiatrist or something. Uh, but not <laughs> me. Live on camera juga kan? And like teman kesedaran di sini semua on camera. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's interesting to hear what what uh, what she has shared because I feel like I identify a lot with it as well, you know. And people pleaser, and I think for me, um, yeah, being a people pleaser when I was growing up, I think uh, I mean I have to attribute it to yes, you know, my faith and of course my wife as well. Um, and she has taught me the power of saying no because I say yes to everyone and everything. Oh my god, and, yes. Right? Yeah, you feel me? Yeah, exactly, right? So I, say, I feel like, you know? Yeah, so the power of saying no. So I've learned how to say no as well uh, because I will say yes to everything and everyone, right? And, and then, yeah, exactly. So uh, she has taught me and I think like it's so important to learn how to say no. Um, so did you say yes to coming to this because you cannot say no? No, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, wife of God. Don't laugh, brother. Stop it, I tell you. Uh. Okay, so. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I said yes very willingly, actually. Yeah. Uh, you need can attest. 
so yeah, so but learning how to say no, I, I thought was very important and, and a big part of uh, growing up for me. Um, yeah, learning how to actually put my foot down and say yes. no. And it was so liberating, and it's actually super liberating having the power to say no. I think like people need to learn how to actually say no, because I think a lot of people here, and I think it's a very Malaysian thing as well, it's about yeah. people culture. Yeah. Kan, yeah, boleh, yeah. tak apa, you know, oh, boleh. Yeah. It's a very Malaysian culture thing, you know, we yeah. are like people pleasers actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And plus, safe, safe face. Yeah, you know, right. safe face and semua, you know, nak jaga muka, semua. So I think, yeah, the power of saying no is so important. So that's what I've learned and uh, I've, I'm very comfortable with saying no nowadays. Uh, like, if just say it's not right or I don't feel like I'm comfortable doing it or I know it's going to cost me some form of physical or mental health, yeah. I would just say, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to pass. It's a, it's a no for me. Right, yeah. right. Okay, that's that's interesting. And you know, in, in the topic of preparing ourselves, like you know, dealing with our demons, right? Sam. So I suppose like everyone would have like, you know our own ritual whenever we, you know, for instance, before going up here or like you know, before uh, you know, our gig, we yeah. also have our like you know, oh things that we need to do, yeah. like you know, to <laughs> just is that <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what, what what about you? Like you know, do you do you? How do you then like you know prep your mind so that you know you'll be in the right state of mind, frame of mind before you go on to like you know a game? Do you like you know then uh, I don't know maybe call your wife to say like, honey, I'm playing. Like you know, play for me. <laughs> or like yeah. What, what what would be your ritual to sort of you know? Uh, I'm super super uh, superstitious on a game day. So if I told you all the superstitions I have. We'll be here till tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but I think routine is key. Yeah. Um, you will all have a daily routine, a skincare routine. Yeah. And, you know, um, it's the same with me on a match day. So if we're at home, I, I'll go for breakfast with my family, my kids. Um, I'll take a nap. I'll take a two hour nap. Um, but it just gets me in that flow state where I feel like everything in the world is right. Um, right. There'll be a certain time where I'll shower. I'll brush my teeth before a football game, like a weirdo. <laughs> I don't know why. Oh, brush your teeth every day, Sam. Don't worry. <laughs> 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 yeah, nah. No, but, but yeah, True. but yes. before a football match, so it, it just wakes me up. I feel fresh and yeah. mm. just, just weird. There's there's same playlist, but yeah. Um, Ooh, interesting to know. Like side side part a little bit. You what, what's your playlist? No, you would think it's like Drake, right? But it, it's not. It's like, it's like work from home, and like you. Have, no, I'm not gonna sing it. Yeah, we are. We are genius now. It, it's just weird stuff that you wouldn't expect me to listen to on there. Chinda. Huh? Chinda. No. no. <laughs> like, just. It's okay. Pop. I'm a city zoner too. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just just um, I just think of a routine that you right. follow. Right. Um, it just puts me in a good state of mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I completely, like, you know, identify to that because, like, I, I have a plan and schedule. So if any of that got disrupted, I'd feel like. <coughs> it's the ADHD. We rely oh, on our routine. Yeah, and, and routine keeps us grounded. Yes. And we feel safe with routine. Yes, exactly. A, a slight change in routine is. Um, uh, this is why I think I feel uh, like much I need to get my husband. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I feel like I need to get my husband a screen as well because it's the same with him as well. It's like it's a slight change in routine and the whole thing just like much up. No, uh, yes. you know, Dajjal is coming and the earth is opening. Why? Because oh, we lambat setengah jam to pick up the anak. Ah, uh, itu je lari rutin. Tapi nak macam rutin segala yeah. langit badai bagai. You know, uh, but it's routine is so important. So I completely feel you. A slight nick, it's like no, no. Mm -mm. True. Mm -mm. Yeah, you you feel like unsafe, and and, and yeah. it's just like oh no no no, what, what's oh, happening? Balance. Right? Yeah yeah yeah. True 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 true. Right. So, uh, Brendan, right? Uh, you were saying like you know now you learn how to say no. Maybe you want to share, like how do you say no? Because to many of us. Right? It, it's very hard for us to say no, right? especially at work. Because we know like, if we say no, it will limit your uh, like, you know, promotion. Like, you know, then your boss will say like, ah, okay, like, Dini has to check out no, right? Like, then, then you know, you go to the other person and things like that. So, 
How do you navigate that? How do you say no? That's a great question, I think, yeah. Um, I think it's very simple, just and oh no. <laughs> Literally, I mean, I don't... <laughs> okay, welcome, uh, thanks for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> I mean, I mean, oh, no, on, I mean, seriously, honestly, honestly, um, you know, it's as simple as... It, it, people make it out to be so hard, and it, it requires practice, it and practice hard. makes perfect. It and of course, hard. it depends on context as well. If your superior asks you to do something, you don't bodo bodo, no. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, like, come on, right? Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, thanks a lot for being part of Iceland, or, you know, you can join IA Joho or something. Like that. <laughs> but what, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, I mean, I, I, that bit, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had to, because for me, when, I, when I'm saying no, you got to understand my context is like, for example, like, you know, uh, projects or campaigns or things like that, which sometimes pays uh, quite a good sum of money, and, and it's, for you to say no is because you know it's going to cost you at the expense of family time, it's going to cost you at the expense of your own personal time, your own mental health as well, not being able to uh, submit to or you know, be able to commit to the timeline and you know you just will die doing it. And that's the power of saying no. I understand some people uh, in work environment, for example, if your boss asks you to say, do something, you can't say no, but sometimes it's difficult and I, and I understand that. So yes, it's, context it's contextual as well. Uh, but having said that, uh, you'd be surprised to know that, I mean, two parts to this. The first part is, of course, uh, within the boundaries and limits of what you're expected to do. Uh, if the person who is asking you to do it is within that limits and those boundaries, there is no reason for you to say no. That means you just, you know, the bay just want to say no, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if it's not in that boundary or out of that boundary, sorry, or out of that limits, then you have the power to say no. And you'd be surprised to know this is the second part. When you say no, uh, you'd be surprised to know, not not N O, but K N O W. You'd be surprised to know that when you say N O no, uh, you actually, um, in that process, you are actually respecting yourself. And when you are respecting yourself, you soon realize that people actually respect you for saying no. Yeah. Uh, and that's the turning point for me as well. You know, to realize that that when I say no, I'm actually respecting myself. And when people see me respecting myself, they actually respect that. Um, so yeah, so that's something that I feel like, you know, you can, people out there listening can really, really consider. Um, and it's just the power of saying, you know, not because you want to say no, but because you know your limits, your boundaries, and you know that by respecting yourself, people learn how to respect you as well. Right. And, and Leah, like in, in that same breath as well, right? Whenever, for instance, like you got triggered, so for instance, like, you know, that slight change in like yeah. in your routine and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So when you got triggered, how do you deal with it? <laughs> <laughs> I like the answer already. Terus bandar lah macam tu. Dia lah target practice. <laughs> dia lah punching bag. Uh, tapi dia lah juga pel bantal peluk. Uh, kan sound wall. One stop center. He's one stop center <laughs> lah actually. Um, no, actually um, uh, usually uh, it's it's funny what what um, I'm going to come back to this. Uh, for the supporters of people with mental health awareness when we do get the support I want to touch a bit on the supporters because eh? I know many of you are sebenarnya. so um, with my triggers it's um, it, since uh, it can come from anything and everywhere and whatever situation dari kecil sampai lah kebesar 40 years of living there are bound to be more than one trigger uh, but um, the best would be to just breathe. Breathing exercises are, are key. Mindful breathing. Uh, ini psychiatrist I aja. Uh, sebagai seorang, uh, actually if you if you practice a if you are practicing, um, if you have a religion that you believe in, uh, God, uh, the best would be the two prong approach. So basically, one is the breathing. When you breathe, you take a deep breath, and when you exhale, uh, for the Muslims, you can zikir. So kita do two birds with one stone. Satu, we are regulating our emotions, regulating our breath, regulating our heartbeat, and at the same time, dapat pahala. Chachu, ah, macam tu. So itu ada sekitar saya aja. So that's it. And we've got so many zikirs to uh, choose from. Um, in any other religion, also, you know, you you there's there's always a, a chant or a mantra or something, and that that is, that practice actually comes from yoga. Uh, so instead of the Om, uh, we do um, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, so on and so forth. So yeah, so uh, that's 
one. Um, otherwise, if you're at home and if you are able to, terima kasih Islamu. Take a cold shower. Uh, when you're triggered, like really, oh my god, don't laugh, <laughs> use, <laughs> don't laugh that because that is uh, basically when you're having an anxiety attack, when you're triggered and that the anxiety attack is coming, take a cold shower. But prudently use the water smartly. Ah uh, yes, of course. Water? Yes. Okay, As, but then and no need. Ah uh, yes, but also uh, also like much you have to conserve energy, right? So no yes. need to switch on the heater. Saju, <laughs> ah, okay, saju <laughs> better. So just take a cold shower because that that helps the anxiety mm. as well. Mm. Uh, or drink lah if you don't have if you tak kena tengok tengok office kalau je ada nak mandi. Tak boleh salah tu. Macam macam surat yang kau dapat besok ni. Tak boleh. But take, get a glass of uh, cold water lah. Uh, like that like the challenge nanti you guys have to do the challenge nanti. Right. So yeah, uh, you know cold water, cold water eh. Ah, tak ada nak cakap, oh, air sejuk nanti sakit lelah Then on, <laughs> bila kau dah begini Dah macam nak tarik rambut And hijab, segala bagai nak Nak, nak, nak apa nak, nak campak already Tak ada hanya Sakit dada ke sakit tekak, tak ada, tak ada Tak fikir dah uh, So, and, uh, sorry, I want to touch a bit about the support system yes. How how important is that, do you feel? Yes, because especially in the context of what Brandon said about saying no So, okay Um with mental health, uh, well, people, when we dah sedar, kita ada masalah mental health or kita ada uh, mental health issues, yes, we do need support. Of course, we do need support. But that is why um, people like Juanita and Nyasa are working to get these various support systems available to us. Because not everybody is lucky enough to have the support system that we have. You know, my husband, my family. You know, uh, you can't be sharing your husband with ten. Uh, no, girl. Cuba lah. Baru kau betul betul takut psychotic lah pada kau. Baru kau takut no. Ah, jangan buat hal. So, but yeah, exactly. But you know, I can't be sharing my sisters either. Ah, you know, you know what I mean. Um, but uh, we need to remember as well. Kita ni sebagai yang mengalami simptom simptom. Uh, kesihatan mental yang tak begitu sihat ni That our support system are not trained mm. These support systems are uh, system nurani Support system nurani <coughs> dan dan mental dan and, and uh, emotional support Yes, but they are not trained to do that To take all of that and it is a lot Kalau kita rasa macam it's a lot You bayangkan orang tu yang macam Tapi aku tak ada masalah ni tau Kenapa aku kena nak serap you know, masalah uh, kau So, it's a lot So, we must That's why we need your voices And we need your advocacy And we need your support To, for people like Anita and Nyasa And even our KKMs actually uh, to, 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 to supply this type of support For, for, for everyone else Because not everybody can have that support system And not all our support system Can be available 24 hours True. They have their own mental health to look after. They need to regulate their nose, you know, and their breathing and whatnot as well. So we always have to keep that in mind, lah. Okay. Uh, so much. Um, it's great that we have support. Alhamdulillah. But let's also think about the support for our support, juga, lah. Uh, so in general, yeah. Right. And and maybe one last question, right? To to wrap up. Uh, let's start with Sam first. Uh, what what do you think, like you know, what do you want the the audience, like you know, or like you know, uh, people here to then know about you know your journey so far, your you know your your career, and you know how you are uh, battling and and combating your own demon and things like that, right? Like, what do you want to sort of you know them to understand? I think as a footballer, um, people often think we're robots, so. We are, we are human just like everyone, everyone else. So we are going to have bad days. You know, there's, there's a day, there's going to be a game, an action that doesn't go how you planned it. So and we've not done that on purpose. Yep. You know, I, I've not dropped the ball on purpose. It, you know, it, it's, it's happened. Um, so I think just, I think just as, I, I know people get invested in, in the game and then they spend money coming to the stadium and time. Um, but, you know, we, people don't see behind closed doors, they don't see how hard all of the team works. Yeah. You know, we, we have players play with injuries, 
fan that he's part of and that they still play through through games for. So it's everyone's going through their own struggle um, or has done it at some point. And, and I think just to remember we are we are human just like everyone else. So it, I think it's very very easy nowadays to jump on social media and and write a bad comment, you know, and, yeah. and, and Kill, kill people's feelings. So, um, yeah, just, just like I said, we're, we're, we're all fighting our own battles behind closed doors. Yeah. All right, thank you, Sam. Brendan? Yeah, I think I echo what Sam said as well, you know, because in the same breath, you know, as people, like people only see, like, literally what we post on social media is literally, I would say, like, 5% or even less of what like, real life is behind the camera, behind social media, behind the internet. So yeah, you know, just uh, it's very similar to what uh, people like Juan Anita or through the games that we played, you know, um, to be empathetic. I think it's so important um, because it's true, you know, you never know what the other person is going th going through, and it's so easy. Uh, and and maybe also just take the initiative, lah. I would say take the initiative. Meaning to say that if you know, if I see Sharifa one day. Um, and, and she's so bubbly, and she, if she's not, it's obviously something is not right. And to ask, it's not so difficult to ask, how are you, right? Yeah. I mean, as cliche as it sounds, you know, like Apakaba and things like that, like how you just shoot out a message to ask how someone is doing. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we just took a little bit more initiative. Like and what Brandon Gunn did, right? Like WhatsApp the guy. Exactly, like what Brandon Gunn. Not all of us are going to get a WhatsApp from him, obviously, like what you said. Uh, but we... Yeah, yeah. But you might. You might, yeah. <laughs> Sam might. Yeah. In fact, Sam might reach out to me on the WhatsApp bro instead, yeah. How are you? How are you, yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, in many ways, we can all be little Brandon Gunns, in, you know, and what, what I'm trying to say is that to take that initiative to reach out, it really doesn't take a lot. Um, you never know, like, one slight reach out, how it can transform someone's life. Um, I've had the privilege to do that during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I made sure I had a list of 20 people that I wanted to reach out to and I called every single one of them. And uh, you'd be surprised if it can change one person's life from that call. Um, that's a huge, like, that's icing on the cake. That's a huge bonus already. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud to see I touched more than one life. So just taking that slight, small initiative uh, really, really goes a long way. Yeah. All right. And Leah? God bless you both. Yeah. Yeah. And three, all three of you, okay, okay. <laughs> 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 yes. Yeah, seronok, seronok sangat dengar that they're sharing. Yeah, I mean, that's fantastic, you know. I tell you, I can't, I can't tell you how many times I felt like um, uh, it was just me and my four kids. Uh, you know, it's like, macam, takde, but there were humans that until today, I will pray for their happiness and, and wealth and risk and everything lah. And because uh, just like, ko kita ah tu je, you know lah, like, cale like, yeah. nangis ketu ah. Just you found that, macam ko kenapa we? Like macam kena sama otak aku. Tapi like, you, he took the time. Uh, she took the time to to well, he she okay. So it took the time to te <laughs> to text to to text that. You know, like my child, they know. Uh, so they, they knew that I needed that. So that was fine. Yeah, so that was great. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of all of us, Pazies. Yes. <laughs> um, sorry, you were asking. Yeah, so, so, so what, what do you want, like, you know, the audience to sort of you know, then uh, understand and know about, like, you know, the journey that he had so far? I think, uh, for me, uh, because of um, the fact that I'm stubborn and, you know, I have this... I don't know, I mean, I've been very stubborn and um, the anger was the coping mechanism uh, from, from everything else. So I felt like I was, I, I was um, alienating a lot of people, but there, like I said, like, there, there, there's, there were these people who were like, macam, peduli lah, kau marah, kau peduli lah, kau nak tolak, I'm, I'm here. You know, and so I, I, I feel like, uh, there are so many people like that around um, that, that that really needs to be I don't know shouted about. It needed to be celebrated. Needs to be celebrated, la. And, and if you feel like you uh, because okay, right now I am in a I work in a corporate setting as well, and I completely understand that there are niches and groups within the setting that you feel slightly. Like, 
you know like macam no not my level or I'm not their level or whatever whatever if you can just look past that and just be kind I if anything be kind to everyone because like they like Sam said everyone is dealing with their own issues like literally everyone has their own issues and we do not know how much uh, and how heavy it is so be kind if you cannot if there's something inside you yang macam eh peduli lah aku dengan orang ni kan aku, hal aku lagi teruk aku lagi teruk aku lagi teruk like okay then that means you lagi teruk go and get help heal yourself okay because ah uh, if you have to sampai that that level heal yourself if you have are at the level where you physically and emotionally and mentally cannot be kind to one another you need help okay issues of the mind mental health that's why they call it mental health issues because issues can be dealt with with the proper support with the proper help matters of the heart cannot ah uh, you know so like macam Minda bercelaru boleh dibantu hati yang busuk tak ada ubat. Ah, so if you cannot be kind, get help. Otherwise, just be kind. From a mental somebody who suffers from mental health issues and still not suffering lah, but you know we're we're working through it, right? We're working through it. It's a it's a it's an everyday battle. Some good days, some bad days. That's all I expect. I do not like Pranita mentioned toxic positivity is also a thing. Saya cakap orang nak kesian, awak tak betul eh? Kita tak payah, tak payah. Are you okay? Do you need this? Do you need that? No, I'm not. I'm functioning. Yeah. You know, I've got my medication. I've got my support system. I'm good. You are. You 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 just be you. Be kind. That's it. Be kind. Itu je. Don't tak payah over pun tak apa. Just be kind. Itu je. Thank you so much, Leah. And Again, guys, round of applause for our best speaker, Sam, Brandon, and Laura. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for sharing. Right? Just be kind. So much, Leah. And round of applause for our best.